All right, I'd like you to turn, please, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Galatians in the sixth chapter, Galatians chapter six. I'm going to read from verses one through 10, Galatians six, one through 10. We're going to title this uh, message, The Three Bears. And we're not thinking of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but you'll uh, get the reason why we're going to call it that in a moment. But beginning in verse one, it begins this way. It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them, who are of the household of faith. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. So as we consider chapter six, it really is a continuation of the previous chapter. Uh, it's flowing out of the truths that we saw in the previous chapter, especially about living in the spirit and walking in the spirit. And so what we find in chapter six is the distinguishing features of a Christian who is walking by the Spirit. Uh, what does that look like? And we're going to see in verses 1 through 10 what it looks like in connection with the assembly of the saints. How does a Spirit-filled, Spirit-controlled believer walking in the Spirit, How does what does he look like when it comes to his activity in the local assembly? We're going to see that in verses 1 through 10. And then what's it, what we're going to see in connection with the world itself the wider world, and we're going to see that in verse 11 through 18. The first section, particularly in terms of uh, the connection with uh, the local assembly, we're going to really see that it's a kind of a, an outflowing of a verse that we looked at in chapter 5, verse 13, where it reads this, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve God one another. What does that look like? By love, serve one another. Well, that's what we're going to see as we look at this chapter. Now, as well as, uh, and we'll explain this title, The Three Bears, but as well as that, I want to give a, a kind of an outline to begin with, and it's concerning the law. And so the the first five verses, one through five, the idea is the law of Christ. And so we'll notice in verse two, he says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then in verse six through 10, you have the law of the harvest. And of course, the law of the harvest is that what you sow, you also reap, right? So that's a that's the law of the harvest. And then in verse 11 through 18, the third law that he wants to bring to us is the law of the new creation. And so, for instance, he'll say in verse uh, verse 15, uh, Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, uh, but a new creature or the new creation, as many as walk according to this rule, peace beyond them and mercy upon the Israel of God. So we've got the law of the new creation. And so it's kind of ironic that as he finishes this letter uh, that is uh, addressed to people who are enamored by the law of Moses, what he's saying to them is, okay, you guys, if you really want to get excited about law, let me give you a law to get excited about. Think about the law of Christ. Think about the law of uh, sowing and reaping, the law of the harvest. Think about the law of the new creation. <laughs> 
if you really are interested in law, this is what you should give yourself to. We also notice that this law of Christ in verses one through five, part of the the thought behind it is to do with bur- burden bearing. And so he, he, he says in verse two, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the, the reason this chapter is often called the three bears chapter is because there's three burdens to bear in this chapter. So first of all, there's a burden concerning the, the erring believer. Uh, we see that in verse one, this believer that's been overtaken in a fault. And uh, that's a burden um, that we should be concerned about. And uh, and we should be willing to bear that burden, not just ignore it, but actually uh, go and deal with this brother and help him. And so that's the first burden, the burden uh, or the bear of the erring believer uh, to, to bear that burden. And then, of course, in connection with believers generally, verse 2, not just this man, but bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill uh, the law of Christ. And then the third one is carrying our own burdens in verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. And by the way, those two verses don't contradict each other. We'll see it in a while why they don't. But just the simple idea is that we all have burdens that we need to bear. And there are three of them that are brought to our attention in this particular letter. So with those general introductory thoughts, we want to look at particularly at verse one. And we want to consider this verse in in, in fairly uh, reasonable detail. Uh, I'll just read the verse and then we'll, we'll talk about how we're going to break it down. And so it says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore uh, such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And so we're going to look at four things. First of all, the nature of the sin. What What is this fault that this man has been overtaken in? I want to consider the nature of the sin. Secondly, the one who has to deal with it. Uh, who is this one? that is to deal with it. This one who ye which are spiritual is the description. And then what is the purpose, thirdly, of behind the action? What are, what are they trying to do? And of course, the answer is restore. It's, it's a mission of restoration for this erring brother. So we want to think about that restoration. And then how is it to be accomplished? And we want to think about particularly this idea of the spirit of meekness. So, so four simple ways of looking at this verse, but yet I think all very, very significant in the in and of themselves. And so, first of all, the nature of the sin. The verse would seem to be bringing before us one who has failed to walk by the spirit. <clears throat> Remember, we talked about if we walk in the spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so here's somebody who has failed in this area, and he's come under the power of the flesh, and he's been trapped into sinning. It contains the idea of falling, and and it's not a deliberate, uh, planned, premeditated sin. Uh, He's been overtaken by it. Uh, It's it's something that, uh, an unwitting element, it wasn't like he was planning this and thinking about this and meditating on this and and, and planning his strategy, but he just just became overcome with temptation, responded to it uh, in a a moment. And uh, and so rather than a deliberate misdeed, it was just something that uh, happened to him. Now, it doesn't absolve him of responsibility. Uh, we have to recognize that even if we just fall into something, uh, we're still responsible. We're still accountable before God. It's not absolving of responsibility, but it really is saying that he, he was was overtaken by this. It wasn't planning it in any way, and so. But but he's he's now involved in this this sin <clears throat> as a result of these things. So who is the one who is to deal with it? First of all, notice it says brethren. <laughs> yeah, it reminds us that. In this situation envisaged, we have to act towards him, the one who has fallen, as a brother. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. He's not an enemy. He's a brother. And that term brother, when it's used in the New Testament, always implies kindly dealings. How you deal with somebody in a kind way. 
Uh, and so we, we want to just think about that for a moment. I want to look at a few references, <clears throat> excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 13, the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews, <clears throat> chapter 13 and verse 1. <clears throat> it says, let brotherly love continue. Uh, that, it, that should be a continuous thing amongst the saints is this brotherly love uh, that marks the people of God. First Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. First Peter 3 verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And then just a final one, just to, to get this overall thrust of the this, this brotherly love that should be seen amongst the saints. And this is in 1 Thessalonians, uh, just to, uh, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse 9. It says, um, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So this, <clears throat> this brotherly love, evident very much in the Thessalonian assembly. And he says, uh, what I want from you guys is to actually uh, increase more and more in this brotherly love and it is a it's a beaut it creates a beautiful atmosphere uh, when you're with a group of people who have genuine love for one another care about one another's well-being want to see one another do well and make progress in the things of God it's just a delightful atmosphere. I have to say this uh, this men's conference happens twice a year, um, but uh, some of these guys you, we only see them at this conference. But it's a wonderful time. You, you just love seeing them, and you love being with them and fellowshipping, and it's and that's how it should be in every assembly in every meeting. And so he 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 says, brethren. Uh, so so obviously this uh, the one who has to deal with it. He has to he has to have that kindly dealing. Uh, this person who has sinned, he's not an enemy, he's a brother, and we have to deal with him in a brotherly, kind, gracious way. The fact that he moves quickly to help the brother proves, in a sense, that he is a spiritual brother. He is concerned about the spiritual well-being of this erring brother. And, and so he, he has his, his well-being at heart. It's, it is the believer who has been described for us, ye that are spiritual, in five, uh, chapter 5, verse 16. This I say, then walk in the spirit. You shall not full, fulfill the lust of the flesh. The one that's mentioned in 18, if you let be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. And the one that's mentioned in verse 22, whose life is filled with the fruit of the spirit. And so here's this spiritual man or, or woman, uh, the one who is spiritual, uh, and wants to help this person who has been overtaken with a fault, has a genuine desire to do them good, to help them, and to restore them. A mature believer, we would say as well, as opposed to babes. First uh, Corinthians three one. I, I, I'd like to speak to you uh, onto spiritual, but you're carnal. <laughs> you're, you're like babes, and so this is a spiritual person. There's a, there's a maturity about them. They love God's people. Uh, they're concerned about the spiritual well-being of others, and they 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 see a person in need, and they want to help them. Now, we're going to think about the purpose behind the action. We've thought about what the sin is like. We've thought about who the person is. But what's the purpose behind the action? And it's quite clearly, restore such a one. It's their restoration to the Lord, to fellowship with the Lord, uh, to the fellowship of the saints. It's restoring him. Now, I want to just mention that, first of all, there are several things, pitfalls, when somebody falls into sin like this. Um, firstly, they're not to be ignored. Sometimes we tend to think, oh, well, um, 
if we ignore something, it'll go away. It never goes away. And so we can't ignore it. They're not these people are not to be ignored. It has to be dealt with, but it has to be dealt with in the right way by the right person. Secondly, they're not to be excused. Oh well, he couldn't help it. You know that's uh, that's what psychology is all about. It's about excusing sin. No, no, we don't. It, it, amongst the saints, we want to be honest about sin, not excuse sin. We want to be real about it, and so it, it's not to be excused. We, we can't. Well, he's just you know he he couldn't help himself. No, no, it, 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 we we have to deal with it. We can't ignore it. We can't excuse it. He's been overtaken by a fault. And then they're not to be destroyed. It's amazing. Sometimes if it's done by an unspiritual person and it's done not in a spirit of meekness or gentleness, it can actually, instead of restoring the brother, it can destroy the brother. <laughs> so we have to make sure that we are spiritual. <laughs> that we are in a right relationship with the Lord to be able to restore the one who has been overtaken in the fault. And so, sadly, if we're honest, the job of restoration is often neglected in the church. Things are just let go. Things are generally ignored or excused. And then they get so bad that we feel like we've got to do something and we go in the wrong way and end up destroying the person. And so we either have a tendency to either pretend the sin never happened or to react too harshly towards this one who has sinned. The balance between these two extremes can only be negotiated by the spiritual, he that is spiritual. Uh, it should be normal to do what God says here, but sadly it isn't. It's often it's easy to respond to someone's sin with gossip, with harsh judgment, or even with undiscerning approval. <laughs> and so the job is restoration. By the way, if we had more of a heart of restoration, <laughs> it makes such a difference. Everything, even church discipline, the whole point is restoration. It's not getting rid of somebody. Uh, it's not being done with them. It's the work of restoration. What does that restoration mean? It's used in uh, Matthew's gospel, in chapter 4, verse 21, it's used of mending nets. And uh, one person said this, torn nets are not much good for catching fish, neither are rent assemblies. And again, if we ignore sin, <laughs> pretty soon it could destroy an assembly and uh, make it very... Uh, impossible, really, to to win souls, and so again, just that idea of, of, of used in in, in re repairing nets. It's also used in. Uh, and let's just look at the, the couple of references here. Let's look at the one about mending nets. Uh, first of all, Matthew's Gospel, chapter four, verse twenty-one, just to see the same word that's involved as the word restore. Um, Matthew four and verse twenty-one, it says, and he began to say, "Oops." That's Luke. That's why it doesn't read correctly. Matthew 4 and verse 21, it says, And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. So that's that's the idea of restoration. It's like mending nets, making them useful again, right? They're, they're no use if they've got big holes in them. Uh, same as a brother who has been overtaken with a fault. He's not useful to the assembly in that condition. But if he could be restored, he can be useful again. And so that's the thought. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, and we'll see again how it's used in a different context uh, it's used in terms of mending broken bones. And so 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, and that you be, and here's the phrase, perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 
And so that's often used of a broken bone that needs to be put back together, but you want it to be perfectly joined together. And so an operation that needs both skill and tenderness to be able to do it right, to, to make uh, this person uh, complete again, whole again, useful again. And so he says, uh, this is the, the ministry that is so important. Uh, this, this law of Christ, this, this royal law of love that, that wants to restore, that wants to mend, uh, that wants to make someone whole again. And how is it to be accomplished? Well, he says, it needs to be accomplished in a spirit of meekness. Uh, some translations have a spirit of gentleness. And the idea is this, that uh, part of the way you do it is with a full understanding of our own weakness and corruption. Those doing the restoring must guard against the temptation of pride, as well as the same uh, temptation uh, uh, the, over, the overtaken one struggled with. You see, we're, we're, we're no different. It could be us that are overtaken in a fault just as easily as this brother. And so if you're going to go to somebody, you have to recognize this could be me. I could be the one who has lost my usefulness because I've been overtaken in a fault. And um, and this idea of restoration is so, so important. Remember one time uh, doing door-to-door -door work, and um, I, I did it with a brother. He had never done it before. Uh, he was in his 70s, and uh, he said, I've never knocked on a door. Would you take me? And so the first house we knocked on, uh, there was a, a call from inside the house. A lady said, come in. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, she couldn't come to the door because she had a broken leg. And so her, she just she was off work. She didn't, wouldn't normally be there. And we went and told her why we were there. And she said, she said you know, she said, I, I, um, I trusted the Lord as a little girl. And she said, I went astray. And she said, I was wondering about, you know, the the sheep that went astray and wondered, does anybody care about me? And you came to our door. Isn't that amazing? Uh, just just incredible. The, the timing of that visit was. So, by the way, my friend was sold on door-to-door -door work after the first door. He could see the value of it. Uh, but you, you get the idea that um, uh, we recognize this could be. Can you imagine if that was you, that you'd gotten away and you were wondering, well, where where are the people that care? Nobody seems to care. And so here's somebody who does care, cares about this brother, cares about his fallen state and wants to help him. And yet also conscious of the fact that it could be him. Uh, so the, the idea of gentleness is born of a sense of our own weakness and proneness to sin. And that's why we were gentle with others, because it could be me. Um, the, the idea of meekness, again, it's not weakness, it's strength. It's not toleration of evil, nor indifference to it, but to recognize its terrible effects upon the one who has sinned. And so it's, and there's no fleshly confidence here, but a deep dependence on God to help uh, one, uh, the person to help someone else. It's also not the attitude, well, we, we're both tempted and he, I got the victory, but the one that was tempted fell. Uh, it, 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 he recognizes, but for the grace of God, there go I. That, that really could be me. And um, I really believe we're disqualified if we feel we could never be tempted and fall in that way. It, it disqualifies us from being that spiritual person to go and help someone else. Because I, I, I think that somebody who feels like, oh, that could never happen to me, they, they have underestimated the terrible power of the flesh, and they don't fully get it. And so they're not the person to do it. But I think the one to do it is somebody who recognizes this, this well could be me. And so this restore, uh, so important, of course, it's, it, it necessitates patience, perseverance in the process, a gentleness in the approach, uh, but he, he is determined to do this, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Now, again, part of the background could be that the influence of the legalists uh, made this warning necessary because nothing reveals the wickedness of legalism more 
than the way legalists treat those who have sinned. Often, the legalist treats those that have not kept the standard uh, with brutality and uh, uh, without any tenderness and love. And so perhaps this Galatian background, uh, this fascination with legalism is behind the scenes of this encouragement to do it in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So he says in verse two, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of, law of Christ. Uh, again, through this letter, Paul's been battling legalists amongst the Galatian Christians. And here he hits them again. He says, do you want to fulfill the law? Are you fascinated by the law? He says, Here, here's how you do this. You bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What were, they, what were these legalists doing? They weren't bearing burdens. They were adding burdens, weren't they? They were putting people under a yoke of bondage that they couldn't keep. And so instead of bearing burdens, they're actually adding to burdens, and he said, if, you, if you're really interested in fulfilling the law of Christ, you're not going to add to people's burdens. You're going to bear them. Of course, uh, the point here is that we all have burdens to bear. And we're not expected to carry them alone. We need to not only be prepared to help others with their burdens, which is the thrust of the passage, but we also must be humble enough to accept the help of others with our burdens. And sometimes it's easier to help someone else than allow ourselves to be helped. We're going to see the reason why in the very next verse, and it's spiritual pride. I don't have any burdens. I have my act together. I've got it all straight. And so... The teaching here is bear one another's burdens. We, it seems like we all have burdens to carry. And so the idea of helping our brother or sister to overcome maybe the result of spiritual wickedness is part of it, or even prevent them from going into uh, a fault. Uh, but the idea is this, we all have burdens. Now, the word burden here suggests a weight. It's something heavy and burdensome. And uh, again, that same word, we, if we look at Matthew's gospel, chapter 20, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that it's it's kind of a strenuous thing. Matthew 20 and verse 12. It says, saying, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. So, in other words, it's significant labor has been involved in, in the in the heat of the day, and so it's a burden that is is a crushing burden. That's the idea. It's a very and we all have burdens that we carry, and we can't bear them alone. We do need one another's encouragement and help to to help lift the load. Uh, we we do need the help of our brother or sister uh, in our lives to help us bear the burdens that we face. And again, verse 5, um, it's a burden that can be carried. When it speaks about every man shall bear his own burden, it's like a, back, a backpack. It's not, it's not a big burden. We all have burdens. We all have responsibilities that we're, we have to be involved in ourselves. But then uh, there are burdens that are very heavy that people carry that we, they need help with. And we need help with when we are going through times where we're very, very burdened. Because verse 3 is really on the folly of self-approval. It says, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Now, the word for links with what's gone before. And so here's somebody who doesn't think, oh, I don't have any burdens. I'm, I'm, I've got it all together. Uh, I, my spiritual life is completely in control. And so... Uh, a person entering into such a ministry of burden bearing or restoration with a sense of spiritual superiority is somebody who is self-deceived. This is not the spirit of meekness. 
that's needed to be effective restorer of a fallen brother or the helper of a saint carrying a burden. He's the wrong man for the job, the one who thinks himself to be something. There's no spiritual self uh, strength in self-promotion. Pride actually prevents us from bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. And it's also pride that keeps us from ministering to one another as we ought to, and even receiving ministry from others. It suffers, it stifles ministry in another way. Out of pride, people refuse to receive help when someone else reaches out to help bear their burden. And so it's a two-way street, isn't it? The wrong person to be the helper is somebody who doesn't think he has any problems at all. Uh, he's arrogant spiritually. He thinks he's got it all together. And then maybe the person who does have burdens, but he's too proud to receive help and encouragement from somebody else. Uh, it's a very devastating thing. Since all men are nothing, he who wishes to appear something and persuades himself that he is somebody deceives himself. Proverbs 26, verse 12. We'll just take a minute to read this verse, but it's a very pointed, especially in relation to what's being shared here. Proverbs 26, verse 12, it says, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope for a fool than of him. And part of the reason is you can't help this guy. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't even see he has any needs. He thinks he's got everything together and and he is somebody who is just, there's no more hope for a fool because a, a, a fool might recognize I have need. <laughs> this guy doesn't see he has any need. And so he's, he, in a sense, he's a, his pride is preventing him being helped by anybody. There are a few things, there are few things more self-deceptive than pride. To be proud is to be blind blinded to the the favor of God, the gifts of God that you've received, blind to your sin and depravity, blind to the good in others, blind to the foolishness of self-centeredness. The, the most blind people are the spiritually proud. <laughs> and so he says, <clears throat> this man deceives himself. Now he moves on in verse 4. It talks about the necessity of divine approval. He says, but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing himself alone and not in another. The idea of prove here, when it says let every man prove his own work, is to put to the test uh, with the thought of or the expectation of approval. And so it's used in, in a couple of places that, that are very interesting. First Peter chapter 1, where it talks about the trials that we go through and the purpose behind those trials. And uh, Peter says in chapter 1, verse 7, he says, The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, as though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory by the appearing of Jesus at uh, the appearing of Jesus Christ. And the idea is this that the trial is not is not designed uh, for us to fail, but it's so that we we might meet God's approval in the way we go through the test. And sometimes the Lord puts us through tests uh, just with the thought that of our approval in view, that we we actually succumb uh, to a dependence on him and we, we, we're successful in the trial. So the idea of testing with the expectation of approval in view. And so uh, this, this man does not measure himself uh, against his fallen brother, but against the word of God. And so he says, uh, let a man prove his own work. Never mind what this man has done in his field. How is my work in the presence of God? You see, he's, he's, he, how does it stack up to the word of God? And, and so he's measuring himself, not against others. In fact, we're told in scripture not to do that, right? Those that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. But what he's doing is he's, he's being honest in the presence of God about his own work. 
and uh, testing it before God with a thought of approval. It's God approving of the work that I'm doing. Here's a man that lives in the spirit. He's really honest about his own labors. Uh, he's not thinking himself to be something. Uh, he's proven his own work, testing his own work in the presence of God. And um, again, we just we need to do this. We need to just ask the Lord to search us in his presence. How is our work in terms of the word of God? Is it stacking up? And of course, if it is, if we're doing this, if we if we prove his own work, then shall we have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And so the idea is this, he's got joy in his own walk with the Lord and, and, and what the Lord is doing in and through his life. And so the, there's a sense of, of deep uh, joy in, in his spirit that he he's, can honestly uh, assess his work in the presence of God and it brings joy in his heart that the Lord has enabled him to fulfill this work and do it. Verse 5, he says, Every man shall bear his own burden. Now, this is, again, something carried is in view uh, with the word burden without reference to its weight. So it's not like the, the burden we saw uh, in verse 2 that needs a special help. It's the burden that we carry ourselves. Uh, and so it's used of carrying a pack. It means personal burden or responsibility uh, for our own conduct and service. And, of course, it's true, isn't it? Uh, I'm going to give an account to the Lord for my work, not for anybody else's, right? We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We all have to uh, carry um, that responsibility of the work God has given to us before the Lord. And so this man is deeply conscious of his personal responsibility, He's not likely to think of himself as something when he's nothing. <laughs> um, and so that's the thought here, that he, he he's bearing his own burdens. We all carry our own load of responsibility toward God and toward men. Now, of course, part of our responsibility towards God and toward men, you might ask the question, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> the answer is yes. So part of my burden is how is my brother doing? I've got my own responsibility before God, but I'm also should be concerned, uh, just like this one overtaken in a fall. And we're, we're, we do have burdens of responsibility placed upon us. Every one of us do. And so um, we, we have our own responsibilities, but we're also responsible to help others bear their burdens. And so we, we recognize there's a lot of responsibility in being a child of God. It's a, it's a responsible thing. It's an accountable thing. We're accountable uh, for our own work. Uh, so, yeah, we have to help others bear their burdens, but we also need to bear our own burdens, our own responsibilities, and bear them up before the Lord. So we move on now to verses 6 through 10 to this law of the harvest. We've thought about the law of Christ. Now I want to think about the law of the harvest. And part of the burden of responsibility is to support servants of the Lord. Notice verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now again, this verse 6 is not some random injunction, but sets the context for the following verses of sowing and reaping. Uh, Bishop Lightfoot, uh, an Anglican uh, preacher of a former day, godly man, he says, I spoke of bearing, this is how he would translate this, he said, I spoke of bearing one another's burdens. There is one special application I would make of this rule. Provide for the temporal needs of those that teach the scriptures. Okay, so this is part of what he's saying. Uh, Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teacheth in all good things. There's a sense of personal responsibility in connection with displaying practical fellowship with those who teach the word of God. Again, it's a case of sowing and reaping. You see, somebody who teaches the word sows and reaps, right? It's a, it's a ministry of sowing, right? Teaching the word, we're, we're sowing the good seed of the word of God. And we expect to reap, in the sense that there is response to that. People respond to the word of God and 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 th there's a harvest. When lives are brought in conformity to the word of God, there's a beautiful harvest. Uh, sometimes maybe sowing the word in, in an evangelistic way 
and there's a harvest in souls being saved. Sometimes it's used in an instructional way, in an edifying way, and Christians are built up and they're encouraged and they're, 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 they 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 want to press on and, and serve the Lord. And, and so there's a responsibility there too. It's a, it's a sowing and reaping ministry. And this principle that he's dealing with here about uh, teaching uh, and also communicating with those that teach is fully developed in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, it's interesting. Paul talks about, you know, kind of in, in 1 Corinthians 9, and we'll quote from it a little bit later, uh, but he talks about, you know, the farmer that's that's farming. He expects to eat some of the fruit, right? There's, and he gives a lot of illustrations. Very, We'll, we'll talk about them shortly. But but the th- Paul did not always uh, avail himself of it. And that's one of the things he said. I have the liberty to be supported and also to refuse support. And he, he goes on in that in chapter 9. By the way, it's interesting. Um, passages like this, although they're important, they can be very awkward for preachers to speak about <laughs> uh, and to teach upon. That's the, the value, I suppose, of going verse by verse is you can't ignore these things. I mean, it's not something that anybody who is – I guess, supported by the Lord's people, would particularly want to speak upon. It would be the last thing on your mind. In fact, Martin Luther says this, these passages are all meant to benefit us servants. I must say I do not find much pleasure in explaining these verses. I am made to appear as if I am speaking for my own benefits. <laughs> and, of course, there's always that danger, you see, that, you're, well, this is, this guy is self-serving. He's He's telling us this because he's looking for something from us and so uh, we just have to be recognized that uh, we're just dealing with it because it's in the passage but it's not easy to deal with it but he does say let let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things and of course um, part of the reason perhaps contextually it is here is because of the judaistic teachers maybe the true servants of god in galatia who were upholding the gospel of the grace of God, were being neglected. And the funds were being siphoned off to these legalistic guys who were coming around uh, getting notches on their belt for the number of people they could get to be circumcised. And so perhaps that's part of the reason that it's taught here. Now, the word uh, teaching here, let him that is taught, uh, means to be taught orally. And it's literally to sound down in the ears is the meaning of the word. And so it's somebody who is uh, teaching the word of God. And also this um, this word communicate, you know, or the idea of, of uh, fellowshipping with this person, is more than just financial support. I think we need to say this. It's not, it's not just about uh, dollars and cents or shekels or whatever was the current currency in Galatia in those days. Uh, a lovely scripture uh, is given in third epistle of John uh, and it talks about a beloved brother third epistle of John um, verse five and of course this is the well beloved uh, Gaius it says beloved thou doest faithfully whatever whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And so in this case, it would be maybe taking into someone's home, one of the Lord's servants, and and caring for them, that the ministry of hospitality. That's the idea that's in view here. And sending them on their way, kind of refreshed and, and ready to go into the battle. And some of us, that's our lives. We live uh, enjoying that kind of beloved Gaius type of ministry where people take us into their homes and they they treat us marvelously and then they refresh us and then send us on our way to the next place. And it's a wonderful thing. And so there's a lot more involved than just mere financial support. Although the word communicate has the idea of sharing. Let's just look at how it's used a couple of other places. Look at Philippians chapter four. Philippians four, and we look at verse 14 
He says, and notwithstanding you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into unto my necessity, not that I desire because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So here's here's a classic example of what Paul is illustrating here in Galatians six. Paul had gone out from Macedonia, he'd gone into Thessalonica, and they had fellowship with him on more than one occasion. Okay, and what does he say? It's not that I'm looking for a gift but I want fruit to abound to your account, sowing and reaping. They were sowing, they were communicating, and he said, you're going to reap. Fruit will abound to your account. And so there's the sowing and reaping aspect. Uh, it's also used in Hebrews 13. This word communicate used again, Hebrews 13, verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So here, it's not just the idea of sowing and reaping, but actually it's a, it's a sacrifice that pleases God. You see that in Philippians 2. It's a beautiful aroma that ascends into the presence of God when somebody is investing in eternal things. And so uh, that's the thought here. So verse 7, he says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And again, these words, although they state a general principle applicable in every aspect of life, you know, the, the law of sowing and reaping, what we sow, we'll reap. That's just, that's just a fact of life. And, and yet the context has to be kept in mind. Paul is continuing to think of material support for the servants of God, and he warns against self-indulgence on the part of believers. And so if we're just sowing to the flesh, what are we going to reap? <laughs> Nothing of eternal consequences, but we sow to the Spirit. Different story. Now, again, just want to look back in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Again, this principle is stated, verse 6 and 7. Uh, this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so, again, this, this idea of sowing bountifully will reap bountifully, sowing sparingly will result in reaping sparingly. And so... Uh, the right relationship between the teacher and the taught is one of fellowship. It's interesting, partnership. It really is a, a partnership. Uh, it's not payment, it's sharing. And it certainly has the idea of um, investing like a harvest, sowing. And so just a couple of other references and uh, then we'll happily <laughs> move on uh, from this section. First Corinthians chapter nine. I uh, just want you to notice a couple of references from first Corinthians nine. We said we'd look there uh, in more detail, but chapter nine, verse 11, he, he says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Uh, verse 14 uh, he says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And then 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. A verse we're well familiar with. It says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And again, I just want to say this, that um, we're not talking about salaries here. Uh, that's the, There's nothing of that thought in here, but it is just a, the idea of res responsibility. Uh, it's it's the idea of bearing burdens. 
somebody has devoted themselves, maybe an elder, uh, could have been climbing the corporate ladder, but instead he's devoted himself to the study and instruction of the saints, then help that guy. Invest in that guy. He's worthy of investment. Uh, fellowship with him, have a partnership with him in his labor, make his, uh, bear some of his burden, right? Make his load lighter. Could be very practical. Uh, could be having the young people cut his grass or whatever, or or clean his gutters so that he can keep in the word of God. It could be a practical uh, helping with gas as he ministers in various places, whatever. Uh, but, but what he's saying here is this, um, th there's a great danger of sowing to the flesh. The, Gal the Galatians were in danger of sowing to the flesh in following the false teachers, and they've got to turn away from such folly and sow to the Spirit. He says, be not deceived, because that's what's going on here. There's a lot of deception. It do, uh, the underlying word is uh, uh, of the word uh, deceived here is the word planet, you know, kind of the idea of don't be getting into the wrong orbit here. Don't, don't be going astray, wandering or going astray. God is not mocked. Don't turn your nose up at God. That's the, the thought that's here. Uh, we, th there are consequences for our actions. And so uh, what a man sows, that shall he also reap. And so it, it says, uh, he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So imagine this, that you, you're prospering well, and everything that you own, you invest in the here and now. Built bigger bonds, bigger mansions, fancier cars, all the rest of it. What's going to be the result of that? Well, moth and rust is going to corrupt, right? And ultimately, it's all going to burn up. On the other hand, what if you invest in eternal things, right? Supporting those that are gone out, taking nothing from the Gentiles, preaching the gospel, teaching the word of God. What do you think you'll reap then? Would it be temporal things or would it be eternal things? And so he's saying, he that sows to the... Uh, to the flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. What's he going to do? It's going to corrupt you uh, because you're living for self, right? So it's a very self-focused life. So it's going to have a corrupting influence on you because there's nothing worse than self-centered people. But it's also uh, all going to go someday. It's, all, it's, it's completely false investment. But he that sows to the spirit of the spirit shall reap life everlasting. And again, the idea is this. It's not the fact that... Um, to possess eternal life, but the enjoyment of eternal life. Can you imagine the enjoyment of being in glory and seeing what your investment has produced? Souls that have been gloriously saved in the presence of the Lamb. Saints that have been overcomers and got the victory because they've been encouraged and instructed by the Word of God. Yeah, and so this is the, the context that, that, that's behind this. Instead of communicating with the servants of the Lord, if we live for ourselves in utter selfishness, the end result will be corruption. It's selfishness ending in nothing. Our harvest will end with this world. But if taught by the Spirit, we take the larger and truer view of life, we would use our substance to encourage the ministry of the word of God. And then he says, um, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Again, this principle, sowing and reaping, there's a day of reaping coming. He's encouraging not to be weary, weary in this good work. It's easy to become discouraged. But he says in due season, the time of divine appointment were to be like the unwearied farmer looking ultimately for a good harvest at the judgment seat of Christ. So he says, in conclusion, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men. And yes, we big of you, all men. How can I be a blessing to people, but especially to them? who are of the household of faith. You see, we said this chapter continues from chapter five. What does 
a man who's walking in the spirit look like? He cares about the well-being of God's people. The fallen brother, every brother, one's carrying heavy burdens. He wants to help them. And then the burden of the spread of the word of God. He wants to take part in that too. He, he just wants to invest in eternity because he has a long view. He's looking for a harvest in eternity. May God help us to be encouraged by these thoughts this morning. Amen.